really leaning into this Science Monday thing here today because we're going to talk all about dinosaur footprints and where uh, NEPM can help you go through the Connecticut River Valley and find yourself as a dinosaur footprint, footprint explorer where these dinosaur footprints live. But to keep the shameless science plugs going, NEPM Television, Salman Hamid, Hampshire College astronomer from Kainat Studios here at your Amherst kitchen table, you have been loving NEPM Television and WGBH, our parent company's program, Nova. It's okay. So I really, uh, I want to talk more about it at some other time, maybe give more time. But you want to go to Boston to the mothership to go see how Nova happens. <laughs> That'll be fine. Actually, that's exactly what I asked you to do. <laughs> yes, we have to do that. But uh, I, I just want to say that um, for last, for a few years ago, uh, I had sort of like lost a little bit sort of like, you know, um, uh, interest in Nova. And partly because it became, a, it was trying, it looked to me that it was trying to compete with uh, sort of like History Channel or others. Yeah, where ancient it, aliens. Right. It was just like, <laughs> not that... The content was like that, but the presentation oftentimes would be loud, bombastic music and mm. sort of like everything was like, okay, this is some action film. Like, you know, sometimes it's like the wonder component, um, which again, I come from the Carl Sagan uh, sort of like, you know, school of wonder. Yeah. And so that is really important to absorb stuff because the universe is amazing. You don't need bombastic music to go with that, that, hey, things are going to kill you. Yeah. Here is an asteroid coming. No, I mean, like, you know, hey, it is cool. Plus space is totally silent. That's it's a vacuum. Right. So true. there's no sound up there at all. No bombastic music, no nothing. That is true as well. But here is the cool thing. Uh, the new season, and I've been watching uh, with my 11-year-old uh, as well, it's uh, Nova uh, Solar System. And we have watched... Uh, two of the episodes, uh, our TV broke, actually. Like, you know, we do watch it on TV. Tragedy. Sorry, old. Uh, but we have watched two episodes, and I think four of, of them are out, uh, Storm Worlds and Strange Worlds. And I have to say, it is spectacular. The series is spectacular. Uh, what One of the things that I really liked about it was, it's like for everybody. And by everybody, I mean, I mean, I know, what, like, you know a little bit about the solar system and things like that. You know, more than a little bit. But <laughs> I was glued to it because the type of examples they picked are not the most commonly used examples. And so you go like, huh, well, this moon, I didn't know much about that. Or if sort of like, you know, something is happening on Jupiter, the type of things they would pick up are actually really interesting for me, but uh, for my wife and for my kid. For them also, it was interesting because the way they would explain it they would actually focus on the sort of like you know, the foundational science concepts, but the type of examples you are they are using are fascinating. And one last thing I want to say about that: a lot of the ones also emphasize of what makes science interesting. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it's not just here is a solution, but rather, hey, this is what makes sense. But guess what? This is not what is happening here. So, what might be happening? And you can see the People that are being interviewed on the show, they're fantastic, and you can actually see their enthusiasm and also how they are trying to solve a problem. Like, you know, and, and so I highly, highly recommend watching Nova on NEPM TV. I didn't ask him to do this shameless plug. <laughs> he wanted to do this shameless plug all by himself, but I will add to it that if you become a supporter of NEPM, you get passports, you get access to Nova, and the Ken Burns documentaries and all of these television things, you support radio, you support TV at the same time, NEPM.org. This is not a fun drive at this point, but support NEPM now. What, where, what are we going to talk about, though, in our own mini version of Nova? Nova means won't go in Spanish, but we're going to... Vamos! <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> well, I, I thought uh, that we can spend uh, the rest of the time on actually a really spectacular image from James Webb Space Telescope. Oftentimes people say, hey... What is James Webb doing? And yes, it has been uh, doing fantastic science, but you also have sometimes spectacular images that come out. And, uh, and the image that I have on an iPad, not everybody can see. No, radio listener, you'll have to imagine this. And uh, you can actually uh, Google or whatever you do. Uh, NGC 602, that's the name of this star-forming region, uh, and James Webb or something like that. It's a beautiful image. And what's interesting about that, this is not 
part of the Milky Way galaxy. But it, in fact, this ne uh, nebula, this gaseous uh, stellar nursery or where stars are forming, is actually part of small Magellanic clouds, which is a satellite galaxy to the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, it's much smaller than us. It's uh, visible from the southern hemisphere. You should be able to, if you are over there, if there are listeners in the southern hemisphere, you should be able to see with the naked eye, large Magellanic and small Magellanic clouds. And what this shows, Hubble Space Telescope had looked at this region. There is a beautiful picture that Hubble Space Telescope took, but Hubble Space Telescope deals with the visible light, light that uh, we are sensitive to with our, uh, with our eyes. Meaning we can actually see it with our real human eyes in our real human capacity. And, uh, and what it found was, well, there are a lot of stars being formed. And in the middle of it, you have some large stars which are 10 to 20 times more massive than our sun. And these are the stars their light, which is oftentimes they, they emit a lot of ultraviolet light and others, it has carved out a cavity in this uh, nebula. Uh, it's, a, it's a little bit like uh, people are familiar with pillars of creation, mm -hmm. because that is also the reason why those pillars have formed. It's because that light from big, massive stars have carved out those regions. And so some of Google the, that image too, by the way. It's another gorgeous image. And some of the denser regions take more time to evaporate. This is called photo evaporation, or basically through light you are uh, basically uh, vaporing off some of the gases. And so the denser parts take a longer time compared to less dense parts. And that's the reason why you have these structures that get formed. And so that's what Hubble had done. And James Webb Space Telescope, because it works in the infrared, it can reveal a lot more in the picture because it can see through dust, gas and dust a bit more. And so this is the image in there. But what is interesting about this particular image now is that, they, that James Webb Space Telescope has revealed for the first time these objects called brown dwarfs in another galaxy. So we knew about these brown dwarfs in the Milky Way. Now brown dwarfs are basically uh, failed stars or, or, or objects that didn't, were not massive enough to have nuclear fusion of hydrogen into helium. So when we talk about, hey, what is a star? We say, well, at the center, there is fusion going on between hydrogen into helium. Mm -hmm. But these brown dwarfs are a little bit smaller than stars, and so they do not fuse hydrogen into helium. They are, you can think of it, much, much bigger than, for example, planet Jupiter. So they are expected to be between 13 to 75 times the mass of Jupiter. So they're not, they didn't get to the fusion part. We had this conversation off the air the other day where Jupiter is so big that, in theory, it could have turned into a star if fusion kicked up in the middle there, but it turned into a big, giant, gaseous planet. So this is, is Jupiter considered a brown dwarf or not big enough to be? No, so it's not. So, so there is a different type of fusion uh, that happens, but so, so there is a particular definition regarding brown dwarfs. But no, Jupiter is much smaller than a brown dwarf. So as I said, it's about between 13 to 75 times the mass of Jupiter would be these objects that are brown dwarfs. Why are they called dwarfs? Because they are small. Because compared they, to other suns. Compared to other stars, yeah. right, compared to other... Uh, so this brown uh, dwarf is sleepy, which makes it unhappy. <laughs> it's a little grumpy. It's dopey because it doesn't have any fusion. Uh, and bashful doc, who am I missing? And, and, and it's from South Asia. <laughs> <laughs> he said it, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but the thing about uh, these... Uh, so by definition, from that perspective, they are also free-floating. So they are not part of uh, orbiting around another star, but they are free-floating. So uh -huh. in the Milky Way, we have discovered around uh, 3,000 of these brown dwarfs. Now, the interesting question that astronomers had, so when you look at these star-forming regions, and we know how stars form, so, lo so a few big stars, but a lot more smaller stars. This is something called a stellar mass function. This is really important. We actually talked about this a little bit when we were talking about James Webb discovering the farthest galaxies in the universe. And the question was how big those galaxies are because you have to make assumptions from what you are seeing, the light that you are seeing, into how many stars there are. Mm -hmm. That assumption comes from this thinking that 
what is the distribution of stars that form in a nebula? So you have a few big stars, but a lot more smaller stars. That's how it goes. It's like something that shatters. For example, a glass, you would have smaller big pieces and a lot more small pieces. Yeah, yeah. And so and then you end step on them because you thought you swept up appropriately <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're wounded for like a week and a half. So the question is, well, we knew about the smallest stars and there is a relation sort of like, you know, people try to figure out, okay, if this many big stars, then this many small stars. The question was that, is there a lower mass cutoff? Is there a place where you just stop forming stars? And so brown dwarfs in that case are really important because they are, they are the lowest possible thing. They're smaller than the smallest stars. So the question is, do those brown dwarfs stop forming in the same line or the relationship from the big to the small extend all the way to the smallest objects in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it looks like, so why this image, apart from being spectacularly beautiful, it's, beautiful. Uh, it's also important because it looks like astronomers have detected in this particular system uh, about 64 candidate brown dwarfs. And uh, you, if you go to the James Webb uh, site, there is also, in one of the places, there is also a slider between Hubble Space Telescope image of the same region and the James Webb Telescope image. And you can actually see the finer details that are coming from James Webb. And you can also see the smaller stars showing up in there. And so, well, this is all well and good, but why am I calling them candidates? Mm -hmm. It's because... Snow White has to approve them as dwarfs. <laughs> It's because there still could be background galaxies, galaxies that are really, really far away, or uh, there could be some background stars. And so they still have to do more work to figure out whether these are there or not. But it looks like that astronomers have discovered these 64 potential brown dwarfs in another galaxy, which is for the first time has been found. And it looks like that the relationship, as I mentioned, the stellar mass function of how many big stars versus the small stars, it continues smoothly all the way to brown dwarfs. So brown dwarfs are kind of like stars. That's what it means. It's like they're not completely, their process of formation in the nebula is the same as the process of formation of other stars. So they're like D-list stars as opposed to like the A-list stars that get you know, to walk the red carpet and all that. that I think that is, that is accurate. And can I mention one other thing when you are looking at this image? Yeah. So there are about close to about 1,500 stars in there. But to me, one of the like amazing parts of it is look at, it, it almost looks like there is a hole in the sky, right? Like, you know, because that nebula is coming in. But look at the edges because in those edges, you will find galaxies. Whole other galaxies with billions of stars on their own. But those galaxies are far, 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 far away. But they just happen to be captured in the image. You can also see some galaxies in through this nebula as well. And I just find it's like a portal. When you look at this image, to me it was just so spectacular. It's like a portal in the sky. You have this object in, in front of you only, I should mention, 200,000 light years away. Mm. Nothing. Pretty close comparatively. Even the Andromeda galaxy is two million light years away. But some of these galaxies, you would, they would be uh, uh, like you know hundreds of millions, if not billion light years away. And you are seeing in the same image. You are just looking at in that direction. I just find that absolutely spectacular. A quick question about the image itself. You said you can slide back and forth between the Hubble image mm. and the James Webb image. The Hubble image in the visible light spectrum, meaning we really see it. The James Webb image from infrared, which must be translated into visible light for us to see. Now, this it's hard for me to swallow because in, real, in reality, this picture is an artist's rendering. There's no other way to describe it. Really, it has been a scientific artist's rendering, but an artist's rendering nonetheless. Oh, yes, but that is the case with Hubble image as well. Really? You're right, because all you are getting is... Uh, is how many photons or how many, uh, you know, you have a CCD, which is sort of like the camera. Like, you know, you're getting photons hitting over there, but somebody has to make a decision of what value you give to those colors, 
right? And because our eyes don't exactly work like a camera. Right. And so, and, and there are filters that they use in these telescopes. And so the light is filtered through a particular light. Those filters are not the same as your eyes. So even with the visible light, they actually try to translate what it would look like to a human eye. So all pictures from outer space are artist renderings and it's all science is a hoax. <laughs> no, and that's why I want to be clear about that. So philosophers get really interested in it. Okay, so what is real? Yeah. Right? And, and that has, uh, and we have, uh, so, so let me come back to it because there is something that we have talked about before about what is real. Uh, because in the in, we don't see the infrared, right? But snakes do. Uh huh. So if you ask a snake what is real, that would be a different answer to what you and I would call it. Luckily, real. I'm a parcel mouth, just like uh, <laughs> Lord Voldemort and Harry Potter. So what I would say is, when you are looking at these images, so the infrared image is a much more extreme example because, of course, we cannot our eyes won't be able to see that. But they are trying to give you a picture of if you could see in the infrared here are some of the features you are going to see right and so strong and that happens in the visible light as well that they are telling you that if you could see invisible light this is probably you're gonna kind of want to see but for astronomers they don't care of what it looks like in color but rather what is the value how bright it is in a particular wavelength so it's all data the it scientists are getting all data. They're interpreting that the data in a way that normal humans will care about. It's like the scene in The Matrix where they show the guy who's just looking at all the, the ones and zeros of the Matrix. And he's, it looks like gobbledygook, but he says, but all I see is blonde, brunette, redhead. Actually, that's not a bad example. That's actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, but, but if you want to really figure out sort of like, you know, in terms of what a brown dwarf is doing or sort of like, you know, or what is happening in the nebula, you are not going to be looking at, hey, what color is this? No, you are actually looking at what is the value, how bright it is in a particular wavelength. And that wavelength would correspond to a color, but you are not going to be looking at a picture like this. But it's a spectacular picture. It is a spectacular picture. And, and yes, it is in the infrared. And so, uh, no, science still works, man. And, like, you know, and that's why you should watch NOVA, because <laughs> even though that is talking about the solar system, uh, and it does talk about sometimes the James Webb and Hubble Space Telescope images as well, uh, but uh, those are about the solar system. And you would see how science gets done, how scientific questions get resolved. And this is just one of the examples. You get the race for the radio, and you get the passport for Nova and all that other great stuff on television. And David Attenborough documentaries. I think he's still making them. I can't believe I mean, it. It's, it's what, a, what a treasure. Absolutely.